All right, this is a child from Alaska. And I've been so fortunate to be able to work with children from around the world. His age, he's almost five years old. And he's complicated. He, this child also doesn't just fit neatly into the category of CAS. But we can, we're going to see that best practices for him are going to be best practices for childhood apraxia of speech. Do you like to swim? I think, wait, are you staying at a hotel while you're here? Yeah. Yeah, so what, what, do, you, what do they have at that hotel? On a, on a, a hand. And a, on a, a hand. So I'm Do you, do you, do, is there a pool there? Yes. Oh, so you did maybe get to go swimming? Yeah. I'm on top of a pool. Do you know how to swim by yourself? Yeah. So do you need floaties? Like, do you need to have floaties on your arms, or can you swim all by yourself? Oh, I'm okay. Yeah. So mom watches you swim? No. No? It's in the pool. Yeah, in the swimming pool. So without a context, I think that we would have a pretty tough time understanding him at all. And I don't know if you can always hear, but he adds an H um, to many, many uh, words that don't contain them. Um, but one of the things that I did ask about was, was H one of his goals at home? And it was. H would probably be the last consonant that I would want to work on, especially in the initial position, because it's the most devoiced consonant. And it doesn't match very well with a vowel. It doesn't co-articulate very easily with a vowel. But I think that that was one of his goals, and therefore he had overgeneralized it. Mm, okay. He has large tonsils. Uh, uh. Just say uh. uh. Go ahead, say ooh. Uh. Say e. Yeah. Do it again, e. There's that h. Say ah. Uh. Uh. Say eh. Uh. Just say eh. Uh. Uh. Now say eh. Uh. Uh. Yeah. Do it again, say ah. ah. Go ahead now, ah. ah. Now say ooh. Mm. Now say e. He's adding a consonant. Say it again, e. Prior to the vowel. Now you're saying t. Say e. e. And say ah. ah. And say eh. Ah. And say eh. Duh. Duh. Okay. Can you just say eh without a dip? Can you go eh? Good try. Okay. Now say I. I. Do again. I. I. O. O. A. A. Ow. Ow. Do again. Ow. Ow. Oi. Oh. Let me hear you say. Mmm. So he's doing something unusual. He's devoicing. Devoicing is not natural. It's not a natural phonological process, but that's what he is doing. So here's a little video of he and his mom, and we're co he I'm coaching. It. One of the things that we're finally working on is uh, front to back and back to front. So remember, alveolar to velar words and velar to alveolar. And when they come up, we want to keep that initial consonant paired with the vowel and possibly segment away that final consonant. So if a word comes up like dot, a duck, and he's um, going to say dut, then we'll prolong that vowel, duck, and then put on that final uh, ka so that he doesn't um, front or back the entire uh, utterance. Boy? Anyway, they want to talk. The boy wants to go on top? Yeah. Uh, well, tell me. The, the boy wants to go on top. There you go. Good. They're sharing the bed? Yeah. Okay, who's sharing the bed? The Baby. babies are uh, sharing. sharing the bed. bed. Babies are sharing the bed. Get up. What? Get up. So he said, get up. 
So we have to fix that. Okay, there is that word back to front. Get. 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 Tell me. Say get. Get. Up. Get. Get. Up. Up. Get up. The daddy. The daddy's gonna take a nap in the bunk bed. And um, and daddy is sleepy. They're sleepy. Yeah. Where are they gonna take a nap? On him. On him. <laughs> On the daddy. Yeah. Tell me. On. On. Daddy. The, on the daddy. And then the baby took the ladder down. The baby took the ladder down. And there's the word took. 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 Ladder down. And here he is. Um, you have to really listen closely because it's not the most um, loud video of him doing a report on a Siberian tiger at age eight. My name is Thomas. The name of my mammal is a Siberian tiger. It is a mammal because it has fur, is warm blood, and has a backbone. A Siberian tiger weighs 60 by 660 pounds. It is 70 to 82 inches long. <coughs> the Siberian tiger lives in a forest. It can be found. Wait, it can be. Found in Russia or China. This habitat has pine trees, spruce trees, and swamps in it. A Siberian tiger is good at surviving, it has sharp claws and teeth to hunt. It needs to prey on wild pips to stay alive. Okay, so. Um, pretty severe uh, speech sound disorder at uh, age five, and he ra rarely has any type of error, speech sound, speech motor errors. Um, and he's also reading, which uh, makes him sound a little more fluent than if he were then spontaneously speaking. But um, did a great, great job. Okay. So isn't it interesting? Here's a child that can produce most of the isolated vowels perfectly well. Uh, vowel to vowel movement, just the A was giving him difficulty and a little bit on OI. Um, and then you just add another vowel, and then the whole uh, syllable shape falls apart. How old are you? Are you almost four? Oh. Yeah, you're three, but you're going to be four in a couple months, right? Uh. Yes! Say yeah, yeah, yeah! Yeah, yeah, yeah! Yay! Gotcha! <laughs> Another airplane. Let me hear you say bubble. Bubble. Mommy. Mommy. Baby. Baby. Puppy. Puppy. People. Bubble. People. Poopy. Poopy. Yeah. <laughs> that was silly. And that was that example of overgeneralization. Let me hear you say daddy. Daddy. You got it. Okay. Say one. Duh. Say one. Duh. Say one. Duh. Say what? Say ooh, wah. ooh ah. Good. We've got ooh, wah. ah. You know, some of our evaluation is about stimulability and trying a, a few treatment techniques or cues to see what, what's going to happen with those. And it will help us to make our plan for what types of words we want to work on, what types of cues are going to be best for this particular child. Do. Do. T. T. Go. Now I gave him the one, two, three, go in an approximated way because I wanted him to feel that he, successful as to what I was asking him to say. If he couldn't really say any of the words I was asking him to say, then it would be failure, failure, failure. And so that's why I gave it to him as one, two, T. Um, and what you're going to find out, and I'm, I'm always um, happy to let you know what I'm doing wrong. Uh, I have learned a lot over the years and I expect to continue to learn more and more every day. Um, is that I should be also then modeling the correct utterance at the, at the end of when I've asked, what I've asked him to do. So if I said, uwa, do, ti, then I should say one, two, three, go, right afterwards. Can you say, Kruh. Kruh. Nice! And that was because he said go as do, and I wanted to know if he could at least get into that velar positioning with a, like a, a guttural, Kruh. and he could. That gives me an idea that I'll probably be able to get a ga and then eventually get a, a word like go. When I think about typical toddlers, um, I think about how do they start to form words. 
they don't usually come right out and say bottle, right? Except for the British kids. They might say, mommy, I want my bottle. But a lot of the kids just don't come out and, and, and say bottle like that. And so they may say ba. They may say ba ba. Maybe they understand that there's two parts to that word. Maybe they can get right into ba do and they finally get to bottle, but no one had to teach them. And this is not any true type of hierarchy, it's just examples of how children simplify the motor plans of words right off the bat and do them the way that they can best manage them on a motor level. But the children who struggle to speak don't necessarily go through these uh, simplifications of adult forms of words and get to the full target on their own. And that's where we come in. We need to help them to get to that target. But if we continuously ask the children to produce full words and just think that by bombarding them with the full words that they're going to then learn them, it doesn't happen easily, especially with children with apraxia of speech. So, so helping, asking them to, to produce full words is setting them up for failure. We need to figure out what is their highest approximation for the target words that we're working on and then continuously move them to the full adult targets of words, especially words that are important to them. Errorless teaching, or, or sometimes people say errorless learning. Errorless teaching is a method of cueing before failure. So the technique helps children to emit successful responses on a given goal. There's an immediate prompt or cue that prevents the child from emitting a mistake or error, and thus helps them to practice correct responses rather than errors. Children will be more inclined to cooperate with errorless teaching. So errorless teaching is a lot easier when you're working on something like receptive language. So let's see that, say that you have a ball, a car, and a shoe on the table, and you say, where's the ball? And the child is going, obviously, to the wrong item. You have time to take their hand and put it on the ball and then success, that's a successful response, and then you can reinforce it. You don't want them to put their hand on the shoe and then have to say, not the shoe, the ball. Because basically, you're just leaving a residue on their brain of an error. All right? My best analogy for that are those of you that still remember chalkboards. Um, when there's an error and you have to erase it with an eraser on the chalkboard, it leaves a residue. And so we don't want the error to occur at all. So if we cue before failure, then we're not really leaving that residue of an error on the brain. And uh, so errorless teaching. So you know, for speech motor, kind of have to know where is the error likely to occur. Children are really struggling with a second syllable, then you're going to have to cue that medial consonant so that they'll be more correct on that second syllable. If you know they're going to leave out a final consonant, then you'll give them a cue before they even leave that final consonant out. And so it's harder, but we still want to think about how can we cue before failure, and that's errorless teaching.